1983, in Krakow, Poland, leading scientists gathered to commemorate the birth of Copernicus. Now, you know Copernicus is the guy who found out that the, we travel around the sun instead of the other way around. Of all the lectures that were given at that time, the one that is particularly remembered was given by Brandon Carter. Brandon Carter is a world-renowned theologic, uh, uh, theoretical physicist. Theological, theoretical physicist. It was on the subject of the anthropic principle. Now that word simply means, anthropos means mankind, principle. And it simply means all the world seems to be designed for the inhabitants of humans. The bottom line is that many scientists today are questioning the possibility that there may be a creator after all. In 1980, the Time magazine referred to this changing view, and this is what they say. In a quiet revolution, no one would have anticipated God is staging a comeback. After he's been exiled by common consent among philosophers, now many of the chief philosophers have become believers in God. You see, the Hubble telescope and other means have opened the windows of our understanding of the universe that were not available in former times. The telescopes today are so powerful that they could pick up a lighted match on the moon. Just a few years ago, in some people's lifetime, it was thought that the Milky Way was all there was. But all of a sudden, the vastness of the universe has been discovered. Now it is believed that there are more stars in the universe than all the grains of sand on all the beaches of this world. And they're discovering more galaxies. Here's a sprinkling of what it means, what the anthropic principle means. If this planet was fractionally smaller or fractionally larger, no life would exist on it. If the rotation of this Earth was fractionally smaller or fractionally faster or fractionally slower, no life would exist on this Earth. If our solar system was not exactly in the position where it is in the Milky Way, no life would exist on this Earth. We are, as scientists say, in the Goldilocks zone, just right for human habitation. If gravity was fractionally heavier, lower or higher, no life would exist on this earth. This is what the anthropic principle means. If the nuclear force that binds atoms together was fractionally weaker and just fractionally stronger, no life would exist on this earth. Human life. If the magnetic field that surrounds our earth and protects us from dangerous cosmetic rays from space was just fractionally weaker, no life would exist on this earth. And we don't have to be a rocket science, really, to recognise that if the moon was just further away from us, we'd be swamped with erratic tides. If it was further away, the sea would be a stagnant pond. You see, the moon keeps our earth spinning just right, just exactly right. If the sun was a bit closer, we'd be burnt to a crisp. Or if it was further away, we'd freeze. And uh, you know, the sun is a whopping 95 million miles away from earth. Yet if we travel just a few hundred miles south, it gets colder. If it was a bit further away, Auckland would be like the top of Everest. It's cold enough now at times. If the water froze from the bottom up 
like most, chem most uh, liquids do, our sea would be an ice block. No fish, no human habitation. These are just a few of the thousands of finely tuned phenomena that make this earth habitable. If just one was out of sync, the result would be the destruction of the human race, or more that, it would never come to, for, come to um, uh, place in the first place. A lot of these specialists seem to undo each other with illustrations designed to help people to get the picture for silly people like me that doesn't really understand it. Simple people. I like what Fred Hoyle says. Now, Fred Hoyle, was um, his working life was at the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge. He served as a director for a number of years. He says, a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intelligence monkeyed with the laws of physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. Now, Paul Davies is of the same character as Fred Hoyle, a world-renowned world physicist, and this is what he says. The temptation to believe that the universe is the product of some sort of design is overwhelming. The belief that there is something behind it all is personally, I believe, I believe there's someone, not something. And he goes on to say that many of his accomplices, his friends, also believe the same. They're saying there must be a creator, an intelligence, a design. It just couldn't have happened by itself. Well, we've looked at things great, marvellous, the universe. So let's look at something small, the cells in your body. The cells in your body are smaller than a speck of dust. You can't see them with the naked eye. You have to have special telescopes, uh, special microscopes to see them. And in that simple cell is everything about you. The colour of your eyes, shape of your fingers, shape of your head. Everything about you is wrapped up in that cell smaller than a speck of dust. Each one carries instructions, an instruction manual for every bodily function smaller than a speck of dust. To build a simple cell, you need three million components, and that's as many as a Boeing 777. In a something so small that you would need a great magnifying glass and a great microscope to see. There's no such thing as a simple cell. Now, Carl Sagan, he had a TV program, Cosmos. He said, even the smallest, simplest cell, there's enough information to equal a hundred million pages of Encyclopedia Britannica in one cell. That's just a simple one. There's many more complex. The human body is estimated to have about 35 trillion to 70 trillion cells, all working together to make you the way you are and the way you look, everything about you. A simple cell, in reality, there's no such thing. There is literally thousands of chemicals in that cell working together. The complexity of the cell is absolutely inconceivable. Many scientists have spent their whole life mapping out a single cell and they still haven't finished yet. Even the smallest cell is composed of millions of intricately arranged atoms, DNA, proteins, chemicals and enzymes. Now I've got something I'm going to read to you about what happens in your cell. Cells were once thought to be quite simple but high-powered microscopes changed this thinking. For example, the kinesin is a two-legged, two-armed transport machine. It transports spare parts 
inside the cell wherever they're needed. It pulls its cargo by the shortest path from point A to point P. And if the shortest path is somehow blocked, it knows the next shortest, shortest path and takes it. No one knows how it know, knows where to go or even how it gets the message to pick up the spare parts in the first place. It collects these parts from other machines that are just as miraculously they've made the parts. When not working, the kinesin goes into a sleep mode so as to conserve energy in our bodies. Let's imagine that 10 kinesins were needed to collect and deliver replacement parts for a particular part of a cell. Nine will climb onto one, then go back into a sleep mode, so as only one, hit, one kinesin is used, so it doesn't use that much energy. By the way, the kinesin can take a hundred steps a second and is so small that it takes 125,000 steps to cover a millimetre. That's a millimetre, 125,000 steps to cover a millimetre, and that's going in your, your cells constantly. Travelling, moving, spare parts. It's like a great factory inside your cell. Now, I have the pic I'm going to leave this with anyone who would like to take it. You'll need some photographies, perhaps, of it, but it's there for you. A teaspoonful of DNA contains more information that's ever been written. And where does a cell get all its energy from? Well, it's very simple, really. Little battery packs move through the cell, providing energy. They only last two minutes but they're replaced by millions of other battery packs that keep the process going. Incredible? Absolutely amazing. Dean Kenyon was a world-renowned atheistic evolutionary scientist. He was sure that he had found the answer to the origin of life on Earth. You see, Darwin's interest was in the origin of species, how animals evolved, from the simple forms to more complex. He didn't concern himself so much with how life originated. He was interested in the survival of the fittest, not the arrival of the fittest. And he believed that he had the answer to, all, to how it all started. And he wrote a book. And for 20 years, it was considered the last word on the subject. But at the same time, scientists were discovering the complexity of the human cell and DNA. And one of his students asked him a question. Who wrote the program? Who wrote the program that tells the cell what to do and tells these machines what to do, when to divide? Who wrote the program? And it stopped him. We wouldn't believe a computer would make itself and its own program. Someone must have designed it. Kenyon did an about switch, threw out his books and became a believer that there is an intelligence in the universe after all. But there's more. The double helix strand that you've probably seen so many times is about two metres long. Now, that's about two metres. That is crammed up inside your, every cell in your body. It's the most compact information known to mankind. Two metres of DNA in your cell, and the cell is smaller than a speck of dust. You have about 55 to 70 trillion cells in your body. If all the DNA was put end on end and joined together, they would go to the moon and back 1,500 times. They'd go to the sun and back around about four times. Dramatic, inside your cell. And it's all happening without you knowing anything about it. It's just happening. 
You've probably heard of Anthony Flew, well you may have. Anthony Flew was a British philosopher, taught in many universities, and he was an atheistic, an atheistic lecturer. He was one of the foremost atheist voices of the last 50 years. He wrote some 20 books, 26 books on atheism and the impossibility of the existence of God. He influenced people like Richard Dawkins. But suddenly, he changed his mind. After a virtual lifetime from when he was a teenager of being an atheist, why the change? And this is what he says. Flew said the most impressive arguments for the God's existence are those that are supported by recent discoveries in the human cell and DNA. He said, I believe there must be a divine intelligence. And he asks the question, can the origins of a code be explained in the way that it suggests that there's no code maker? You know, as I look around this room, can you see anything that made itself? I often ask, and I'm a chaplain in the hospital, I often ask people, is there anything in this room that made itself? Hello? Someone designed it and someone made it. Did it just happen? What about you? What about this computer on the top of your head here? Did that just happen? No, someone designed it. Well, what do the good, fine-living, atheistic, evolutionary uh, sceptics say about this? Yes, they say, it looks like design, but it's only an illusion. It is the result of random evolutionary process, chance. As one evolutionary atheistic scientist says, 50 billion coincidences, but it's still coincidence. It didn't happen by design, just randomness. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it'll be a duck. And if something looks as if it's designed and it speaks as if it's designed and it sounds like it's a designer, it'll be designed. The next question, what would be the character of such a designer? Here's the answer. The beauty of this world, fruit, flowers, fragrance, food, fun, family, friends, all speak to me of a loving, concerned creator. Well, let's turn now to the biblical record. We believe that God is responsible for all this amazing stuff we've been talking about. And he communicates to us through his Bible, through the Bible. So we would expect to have some indication in Scripture of the same codes. And indeed there is. As you know, the Hebrews used letters for the numbers. Uh, Aleph, Bet, Gamal, Del would be one, two, three, four. So uh, up to around about 13, 12 or 13, those, those um, numbers were symbolic of certain things. And you know, the letter seven is symbolic of perfection and completeness. The first sentence in the Bible has seven Hebrew words. Seven Hebrew words and four by seven Hebrew letters. The three nouns, God, heaven and earth, have a numeric value of seven, seven, seven. There's one Hebrew word, created, and the numeric value is another multiple of seven. According to some researchers, there are about 30 different numeric features in that one verse alone. Statistically, the chance of that happening is around 1 in 30 trillion. A group of mathematicians were asked to do the same in English without success. But there's more. The second verse in Genesis has 14 Hebrew words, seven by two. And of course, we all know the seventh day is the Sabbath. Right in the center, seven again. 
It's interesting that the Hebrews had the centre. Uh, I can't explain it to you shortly, but it's called a chiastic structure. To the Hebrews, the centre point was the most important. We travel from beginning to end, but the Hebrews had a centre point. Do you know what the centre words in the Ten Commandments are in the Hebrew? The seventh day is the Sabbath. Right in the centre of the commandments, the seventh day is a Sabbath in Hebrew. Coincidence? The finger of Almighty God. The overwhelming evidence is that there is a great loving creator responsible for this world and the universe who has a plan for us. Jeremiah 29 says that. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. But, there's a but, but despite all the evidence of the laws of nature and the promises of God, our lives seem very confusing at times. Yours may not be, but mine certainly is. These concerns often relate to what the doctor says, what the bank manager says, what the children are doing, car needs attention and all the problems of our lives you know uh, sometimes we get letters pay up or face the consequences and these cloud our days despite the evidence around us of a great a wonderful creator even people that seem to have everything have the same feelings if everyone's troubles were written on their brow, we'd pity those we envy now. And my mother used to say, often, here we suffer grief and pain, over the road they do the same, next door they suffer more. Everyone has these problems, despite the evidence of a loving creator. In short, we suffer depression, despondency, despair, feelings of hopelessness, and the good news is that we're not alone in these feelings. I want you to consider a psalm this morning. Psalm 42. It's on the subject. As the deer pants after the, for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for the living God. Where can I go to meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, where's your God? The things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and, joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? Why disturb within me? Put your hope in God, for, I've yet, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. Why soul is downcast within me, my soul? Therefore, I will remember you. Verse 8. By day the Lord directs his love. By night his song is with me, a prayer to God of my life. Now, verse 10. My bones suffer agony, mortal agony, as my foes taunt me, saying all the day long, where's your God? Verse 11, why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for he, I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. So if you feel sometimes a little depressed, you're in good company. Very good company. I want to compare that with a text in the New Testament and it's found in Luke chapter 24. We're going to see the same expressions in Luke chapter 24. It's the story of the road to Emmaus and I'm reading from verse 13. Now, that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking about each other, with each other, about everything that had happened. 
As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what were you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and you don't know the things that have happened here in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, he replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What's more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. It's near the evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. There's some things I'd like you to notice from that, t- that portion of Scripture. The evidence of all these amazing things will never satisfy us. Information such as that is interesting, but it won't satisfy us. The only satisfaction that we have in our lives is a relationship with another person. That's the cry of the human heart, a loving relationship with another person. How would you like to live in a perfect world? A Ferrari in the garage, a Lamborghini as well, and all the roads travel on, all the beaches of the world. It's a wonderful world. Ice cream trees, chocolate trees, anything your hearts could desire. You're going to live forever like that on your own. Not another person in the whole world. Would you like that? We need relationships. That's what we're made for. And God offers us a relationship with the creator that created all those great things. We're like porcupines, you see. We like to get together, but it hurts sometimes. Notice that he walked with them. He walked with them. You see, they didn't recognize him, but God is walking with us constantly. And that was done after The crucifixion, the resurrection. So it's on our side of the crucifixion. And he walks with us and he talks with us. You know, God himself stepped down from glory, came to this cursed earth, walked the dusty streets, got his feet dirty for one reason alone, that we might walk and talk with him in the kingdom of heaven. That's why he came here. Notice he asked the question, two questions. You see, he's interested in what we think. He allows his creation to tell him how we feel. That's what the psalmist is doing in chapter, 20, in chapter 40, 20, uh, in, in the psalmist is saying, it's okay to tell God you feel bad, to feel downcast. He's got broad shoulders. He can accept it. Next, he gave them a Bible study. The scriptures are God's love letters to the human race. Notice the first thing that God does in Eden. He calls, Adam, where are you? And he's been calling sinners ever since, friends. He called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees. He called his people out of Egypt. He called them back from Babylon. He called his disciples. He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And the last text of scripture says, the spirit and the bride say, come. 
Him that heareth say come. Let everyone come to me. So scripture begins by calling God. God calling into us into a relationship with himself. It ends the same way with God calling us into a relationship with himself. We serve a wonderful God, my friends. Then they asked him to stay. They urged him. Have you noticed that nowhere in the record of the New Testament did Jesus reject an invitation of anyone calling him? Even to the Pharisee's house, who didn't like him very much, he went. Jesus accepts every invitation to come and help with us. He invites us to ask him. He, he said to Zacchaeus, I'd like to come to your house. He said to the people of Laodicea, Behold, I stand at the door, I'm knock. I want to come in and visit you. That's the God we serve, my friends. At last he broke bread. He's the bread of life. He's the one we need constantly to live. By living with, like that, we'll live forever with him. May God bless you. You know, I like what scripture says. It's your father's pleasure. No, it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. May God bless you.